All right, good evening everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I'm talking about exercise and small fiber peripheral neuropathy. So in tonight's discussion, hopefully I'll give you a good overview of, again, small fiber neuropathy. My last neuropathy video, <clears throat> I talked about all the nuances of how to test for this. I will go through some of those in details this evening. And uh, I'll also talk about some new information regarding treatment. And if you have small fiber peripheral neuropathy, maybe this will give you some insight of things that may be beneficial. Okay, so let's bring this here. Okay, so the main article I'm citing tonight comes from the Journal of Diabetes Investigation. This was again published, I believe in 2017 uh, by the notable author, Albert G. Smith out of the University of Utah Medical Center. Now, Dr. Smith and I believe another gentleman by the name of Dr. Singleton were some of the foremost researchers in neurology to say, hey, this condition of impaired glucose tolerance or prediabetes, as a lot of people like to term it, is really important for neuropathy. And we think that it's causing this certain type of neuropathy called small fiber peripheral neuropathy. And good evening to everyone who's joining. So they did more studies and more studies. And basically at this point, it is a universally accepted fact that this condition of metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, impaired glucose tolerance is a major cause for those of you who are told that you have idiopathic peripheral neuropathy or cryptogenic peripheral neuropathy, meaning we don't know the cause, uh, but something is causing your neuropathy. Now, uh, again, in diagnosing small fiber peripheral neuropathy, uh, when there's, or let's say this way, in diagnosing a blood sugar or metabolic component to small fiber peripheral neuropathy, we need to understand the reference ranges and we need to understand the right test to do. So again, normal glucose is glucose below 100 when you're fasting, or if you consume or do what's called the oral glucose tolerance test, which is where 75 grams of anhydrous uh, dextrose is consumed, and we monitor blood sugar every 30 minutes, we should not see the blood sugar go above 140 after two hours. And particularly, we don't even really like it to go above 140 throughout that whole test. And so if you're above 140, then uh, that means we're moving into the prediabetes range. If you're below the 199 mark, that's good. If you go above 200, then that's significant for diabetes. Again, prediabetes on the fasting glucose is a number above 100 but below 125. And if you're above 126 on your fasting glucose, that typically means diabetes. Now, the fasting glucose and the hemoglobin A1C markers are the most commonly performed in clinical practice. So if your hemoglobin A1C is below 5.7, then that's considered normal. If you're between 5.7 and 6.4, that's considered pre-diabetic. If you're above 6.5, that's considered diabetic. The travesty that I see in neuropathy patients is that this two hour oral glucose tolerance test is rarely performed, if ever. While this is such a huge component of peripheral neuropathy cases. So again, envision the pie chart, half of the pie chart, so to speak, in terms of causes of neuropathy are diabetes or is diabetes. The other half is going to be conditions like prediabetes, gluten intolerance, precancerous conditions, and then about 77 other causes. But Prediabetes and gluten account for about two thirds of this other half of the pie, so to speak. And so that's where it's so, so, so important that individuals who have neuropathy, particularly small fiber neuropathy, and these are individuals who have burning pain, 
The bed sheets bother their feet, particularly at night. So if you have to kick your feet outside the covers, if you know just simple touching of your feet is really painful, if your feet turn really red, if you're walking outside to stand on the concrete, these are symptoms, the cold concrete, so to speak, these are symptoms of small fiber peripheral neuropathy and prediabetes appears to be the most common cause of small fiber neuropathy. But to be specific, we now want to call it metabolic syndrome induced small fiber peripheral neuropathy. The reason being is that the glucose tolerance test is central to diagnosing this condition. Also, we see the other elements of metabolic syndrome, which you will see here. Waist circumference for men above 40 inches, high triglycerides above about 150, low HDL cholesterol below 40, hypertension, insulin resistance, or again, these signs of impaired glucose tolerance. I believe if you have three out of five by most criteria, that constitutes metabolic syndrome. So this metabolic syndrome impaired glucose tolerance issue seems to inflame the nerves. And when the nerves get inflamed, we have these complicated biochemistry loops involving primarily uh, reactive oxygenated species, advanced glycation end products, increased fatty acids, reduced vascular reactivity, all these different things playing together to cause the small fiber nerves to become damaged. Again, what are small fiber nerves? What are large diameter nerves? If you were to take a dissection of your sciatic nerve, for example, it's about an inch thick, approximately. It's a really big nerve. Uh, when you look at cadaver studies, it is a prominent structure in the human body. And when you look at that nerve under a microscope, <clears throat> you're gonna see big nerves and you're gonna see little nerves. The big nerves transmit signals such as vibration. So if you saw your neurologist and they put a tuning fork on your toe and you can feel it, that is going through large diameter nerves. If you are able to react by, uh, if you're able to go and fly fish in a stream, for example, and you're able to maintain your balance, that involves sensation from your feet, muscle spindle reflexes, uh, which are all transmitted through large diameter nerves. One of the key components you'll see when you work with neuropathy patients, they'll say, wow, I just, you know, I can't go fly fishing anymore. I used to love fly fishing, but I just, I lose my balance. That's because they're losing large diameter nerve function. Whereas the small diameter nerves are principally involved with pain and temperature and sweating. So if someone's saying, you know, I feel okay throughout the day, but then, oh my gosh, I lay down in bed and my feet are burning. I, they, they wake me up. There's nothing I can do. Uh, what can I do to get rid of this burning pain? It's, it's ruining my sleep. Those are the common reports, or my feet are so hot, so I step on cold concrete. That's small diameter nerve function. Okay, so an important element that I talked about last time was that with type 1 diabetes, which is typically going to develop before the age of 30, they're insulin dependent very rapidly into the illness, those individuals can prevent the development of neuropathy if they tightly control their blood sugar. What we're seeing with this metabolic syndrome induced pre-diabetic small fiber neuropathy, however we want to term it, cryptogenic sensory peripheral neuropathy, is that it's not as much related to tightly controlling blood sugar because you can tightly control blood sugar and a metabolic syndrome patient and it doesn't really help the neuropathy. But what does help the neuropathy? Well, there's this diabetes prevention program used in a lot of these studies, and they have patients do 150 minutes of exercise weekly. So what is that? That's about 30 minutes a day, but it's intense exercise, aerobic and some resistance training. They look to have a 7% reduction in body mass over a year. Uh, there's something known as the six-minute walk test, uh, which they use as a barometer. They do quarterly dietary counseling. And, um, and there's something called the Impaired Glucose Tolerance Neuropathy Study. And they utilize this diabetes prevention program with this group of patients who had small fiber neuropathy 
uh, secondary to impaired glucose tolerance. And what did they find? They found, oh, excuse me, I went the wrong way. They found that they had improved regeneration of small fiber nerves. Now, this diagram is not exactly from that study. This diagram is showing improved regenerative capacity after putting capsaicin on the skin. Capsaicin basically activates the heck out of your small fiber nerves and will damage them. And they showed here that these small fiber nerves can regenerate. But in this, uh, this study that I mentioned, the impaired glucose tolerance neuropathy study, they found that there was a significant improvement in regeneration of small fiber nerves with this protocol, 150 minutes of exercise weekly, 7% reduction in body mass, quarterly dietary counseling. One thing that may be difficult for many of you is that you're going to say, well, my feet are exquisitely painful. So how am I going to exercise? And that's really a great question. And so that's between you and your doctor to figure out maybe non-traumatic uh, ways of exercising for your feet. Uh, that's also bringing in uh, other discussions here, as I mentioned here, other compounds looking at TRPV1 inhibition. This is a compound involved in nociceptive activity. Nociception refers to the, the signal of pain before it reaches your brain where it becomes painful. And so there are certain uh, plant alkaloids that I'm researching that may have some benefit. There's a lot of medications being looked at uh, on this topic. But certainly exercise and weight loss leads to greater intraepidermal nerve fiber density. So you can regenerate small fiber nerves through exercise. Small fiber nerves are different from the big nerves because they seem to regenerate because our epidermis is constantly reorganizing. The epidermis is, is several layers thick of skin. And so it's constantly reorganizing. And so the small fiber nerves have to regenerate. And what we're finding is that through exercise, we can promote these nerves to regenerate and those who have small fiber neuropathy. So that's the conclusion. So is exercise effective for large diameter uh, neuropathy? Nothing that I've seen on that point yet, but this is encouraging for those of you who fit that one third of the other half of the pie that is not diabetes. And in fact, for the type two diabetics, this may be something to consider too, maybe of some help to the clinical situation. Okay, so that's it for tonight. I hope you all have a lovely week and I hopefully will be back later on this week with another broadcast. All right, have a good evening.